Welcome one and all. I'm Mark Passio of whatonearthishappening.com. I'm here today as part of the Freedom Under Natural Law 2 conference. Thank you to all of the organizers of this great event and thank you for inviting me to speak here today. My presentation today is entitled De Facto Satanism. And this is a topic that I've been wanting to drill into for quite a long time and uh, paved the groundwork for when I did the Demystifying the Occult seminars, especially Demystifying the Occult Part 2. So this is going to be sort of an extension and addendum to that second part of Demystifying the Occult, which I entitled Satanism and the Dark Occult. This presentation specifically is about what it is to be a de facto Satanist, which we'll talk about in a few moments. So let's jump in, and as always, before I deliver a full presentation, I always begin with some caveats to the viewing audience. You will not be seeing or hearing anything new here today. As the ancient saying goes, there is nothing new under the sun. This ultimately means that the truth is objective and eternal. It has always been here. It will always be here. All that I can do uh, as a presenter is to present my findings in a personalized framework with my particular style and aesthetics applied to the presentation. But the truth remains the truth. And there is really nothing new in that regard. So uh, for people who are always expecting new revelations and for you know all of this new information to come out, uh, you're going to be disappointed because this is basically the same thing that has been going on. It's just I'm explaining it in a way that hopefully will get more people to understand it and recognize it as the truth. That is the only difference uh, in this dynamic of uh, how I do my presentations. The second caveat I always give is if you're a mental child, this presentation isn't for you. So this presentation is not for psychological children. It is for mature adults psychologically who are ready and able to hear the truth. And it is not for those people who appear to be adults bodily, physically, yet they have the psychological mentation of a small child who attempt to think and reason with their emotions. You cannot think with your emotions. You cannot reason with your emotions. If you come at a presentation like this from a perspective of feelings only or emotions only, once again, you're not going to be able to hear it, comprehend it, and truly incorporate it into your existing understanding of our world. So this presentation is not for those people. It is for people who have psychologically matured to a point where they can hear truth that is not sugar-coated. And again, that brings me to my third caveat before we begin. My presentation is often, style is very uh, often intense and at times even combative. People have described it as such. I will not sugarcoat my words or my delivery. Some people who watch this presentation may, may very likely become very upset or angered by what I have to say during this presentation, and that's fine. So be it. That will never make this material untrue. The truth by its very nature is belligerent because it wages war against all forms of deception and mind control. I've never been a person that sugarcoats my delivery style, and I'm not going to start now. I'm going to talk to people like they are intelligent adults who are capable of critical thinking. And if you're not, then this presentation really isn't for you. And uh, I say that openly uh, before any of my presentations begin at the risk of even frightening away people before they hear the first word I have to say, because I'm not about convincing everybody. I am about helping people who want the truth to understand what is taking place in our world. And then the, the babies can go and do whatever they want to do. Uh, this information is not for them. Here's why I do this work overall. I don't present information like this to be liked. This isn't going to get you many friends to make money or to make friends. I speak publicly because I recognize that in the crisis of overwhelming ignorance and deception 
in which we all now live, I have a personal moral obligation to communicate what I know to be taking place in our world in order to help others to understand it as well so that they can then take action and do something about it. And I'm going to begin uh, today with the, uh, the, the dictum of what I really want to communicate about all of this and about what we really should be doing as individuals in this world at the current time in history in which we live. And that's this quote from Immanuel Kant that is, do the right thing because it is right. And a lot of people may, you know, disagree with that or may think that that's uh, some, you know, uh, statement that is uh, seeing the world through rose-colored glasses or something like that. But that is ultimately what we have to direct our behavior toward, the moral right. Even if we cannot quote-unquote win, and I still think we have a chance of turning the world situation around, but I don't do this for reward. This lifestyle, this, um, you know, uh, speaking of this type of information to people who are often very resistant to it isn't going to get you much worldly reward. I do this because I have recognized it as the morally correct thing to do, and that's the only reason that I ultimately continue to do this type of work. As William Penn said, right is right even if everyone is against it, and wrong is still wrong even if everyone is for it. I'm going to stand for what is right. I'm going to speak what is morally right and communicate the truth regardless of what it means for me in the physical domain because it is the right thing to do as an individual. That being said, there is some basic prerequisite knowledge to understand what I'm going to teach in this presentation. So I recommend the entire Demystifying the Occult series. As always, I recommend all of my podcasts at whatonearthishappening.com to get the full framework of this information. But in the short term, if you simply watch Demystifying the Occult Part 2, Satanism and the Dark Occult, a presentation that I delivered back in Philadelphia in 2000, back in 2016, you'll get the general framework for what Satanism and dark occultism is in general. And of course, we're going to review some of that, but of course, time doesn't permit for the review of an entire presentation like this. Uh, so if you want a full uh, framework for what I'm talking about here in de facto Satanism, uh, do indeed watch Demystifying the Occult Part 2, Satanism and the Dark Occult. So let's jump into the material. This first section is entitled Satanism, Belief versus Reality. And there's a huge chasm, it's a huge divide of what people believe Satanism to be versus what Satanism truly, actually is in our world. So let's look at the difference. You see images like this in what people uh, believe Satanism to be, uh, a worldwide belief system of what Satanism is, and it's completely incorrect. It's childish, it's naive, it's kind of asinine. And Hollywood and religion continuously puts out such imagery, and you would... Uh, absolutely find more Satanists in a court system or in a corporation uh, that is selling products to the entire world, a multinational corporation, than out in the woods, black-robed black and hooded, sacrificing animals. Um, these are, um, again, religious and Hollywood-inspired notions of Satanism, and they're there to prevent the proper reception and understanding of what Satanism is as a worldwide religion and ideology that is actively at work in our world to control us. So we have to grow up and go beyond these immature childlike notions of Satanism. Uh, as being the worship of the devil and the sacrifice of animals and people out in the woods. Uh, you know, not to say that certain factions of Satanism may not practice such things, but this is not what Satanism is as a mindset and an ideology, which is infinitely more important to understand how that is at work in our world 
than these religiously inspired and Hollywood inspired notions of Satanism. It is the average person's false belief that the religion of Satanism is about the belief in and worship of an evil deity known as Satan in the Christian religious tradition, of course. Religion and Hollywood together have created this ridiculous and childish version of a religion that is far more complex and far more sinister in its true beliefs and tenets. The false variation of Satanism serves to hide the real thing and to keep its true intents undiscovered by almost everyone. That is the overarching purpose of the false notion, the false belief in what Satanism is. And we have to dispel this. And this is what I've been trying to do as a former Satanist for the last 15 years of my life. It's one of the most challenging and difficult things that I've ever had to do is to try to explain to people what Satanism really is versus what they've been told that it is by their religious institutions and by Hollywood. So here's what Satanism actually is. And I don't say this from book knowledge or being told about it secondhand. I know that this is what it is from firsthand experience inside the religion as a former priest of the Church of Satan. Satanism is an ancient occult religion comprised of diverse interconnected networks of worldwide adherence. That means it is a worldwide belief system and it operates as a, a, a network that connects seemingly disparate groups from all over the world. At its ideological core, and this is what is of utmost importance, this religion, Satanism, postulates that knowledge of the human psyche, our inner workings as human beings, in our mindset, in our mentation, in our psychology, and knowledge of the laws of the universe, or in other words, the way things really work in the physical world, true science, uh, that knowledge combined of the human psyche and the laws of nature should be occulted or hidden and held only by a small group, a few human beings, so that they themselves may retain power, may gain and retain power over the ignorant human masses. It is much more accurate to perceive the belief of Satanism to perceive Satanists and dark occultists in general as ancient psychologists who hold and wield hidden information in ways which will exploit those who remain ignorant of it. That is what the occult is. It's hidden knowledge about how the human mind works and operates, human desires, aspirations, how we think, how we operate, and how the human psyche can be manipulated through symbolism, through imagery, through word choice, through fear, etc. And to hold that information and wield it as a weapon over those who don't have that information, who are psychologically immature, who have no understanding of how the uh, average human mind works and uh, you know those aspects of human psychology and how they can be manipulated. And therefore, the master in that regard, with all of that knowledge, can wield a power differential over those who are not in the know. That is ultimately what this religion is. At the highest levels, of course. As we're going to see, de facto Satanism is low-level Satanism. It's the version of Satanism that is given to the masses of people to keep them under control. So through the power differential that this ruling class gain by the way of manipulating those who remain in ignorance of all of the knowledge that they occult or hide, the small minority who are in the know wish to permanently rule the masses of humanity and effectively become God on earth. That is their ultimate long-term goal of what Satanism is. It is to invert everything. It is to pervert everything, invert everything in the natural domain 
turn everything on its head, and ultimately become gods of a prison society. They want worldwide slavery. They want to rule everybody as their master. They want to be gods on earth. It is important to understand that contrary to popular belief, the overwhelmingly vast majority of Satanists do not worship an externalized deity known as Satan in the Christian tradition, but instead see Satanism as an ideological way of being in the world. And they view the ego-driven self as the god of their religion. The self is the god of Satanism, not some Christian horned and hooved deity, as is depicted in Hollywood and ridiculous versions of what Satanism is by religious traditions. The ego, completely run out of control and run amok and wanting to be god, is what should be properly understood as the god of the satanic religion. And then the next question that people will very naturally and rightly have is, well, why do they call it Satanism? Why don't they call it egotism? And again, they want to take trappings of religious tradition to confuse people and get them thinking of it in terms of, oh, this is some quaint religious belief based on the Christian uh, version of uh, an evil deity, when in fact, uh, Satanism is infinitely more than that and far more sinister than just worshiping some so-called evil deity, uh, externalized deity. It is the ego run out of control, wanting to be God and w willing to do anything to make that uh, eventuality, to make that goal happen in the very real world. So why call it Satanism? So there's two overarching reasons that they take that symbolism imagery and that wording the symbolism and trappings of the christian devil or satan are often used in modern satanism for two reasons the first is to try to make outsiders see this religion satanism as just another quaint religious belief that is based upon traditional christian belief systems and therefore people will dismiss it as something that doesn't have that much active power in the world the second reason they associate it with the Christian tradition of uh, the evil deity Satan is they want to associate themselves with what they refer to as the adversarial dynamic in nature or as it is called in the occult world, the force of involution. So involution is the force which opposes true evolution in consciousness that keeps consciousness held back, keeps it at bay, keeps it uh, folded up and uh, not unfurling and expanding. Involution is the opposite of, of true evolution in the mind. Uh, this comes from the ancient Hebrew word shatan. The word Satan itself comes from the Hebrew word shatan, meaning adversary or opposer. And what was it the adversary of it was the adversary of true evolution and consciousness. It opposed that. It is trying to keep that held back, tied back, enslaved. Satanism as an ideology, as an ideological way of being in the world, is ultimately about being opposed to the true order of natural law, the universal laws of morality which govern the behavioral consequences of beings who are gifted with the capacity for holistic intelligence and free will. Satanists ultimately stand against that true order, that true moral dynamic of natural law that is inherent to creation. Again, they want to be God, they want to destroy the natural order, they want to institute their own order alleged order, which is actually chaos, an inversion of true order, of course. So that's a basic review of what Satanism is from uh, my explanation of it given in Demystifying the Occult Part 2, Satanism and the Dark Occult. Now we're going to get into what de facto Satanism actually is, which is the whole purpose of this presentation. The first thing that we have to understand is what does de facto, what does the term de facto actually mean? 
The term de facto means in deed, in action. It is derived from the Latin preposition de, de, meaning of, from, about, concerning, or regarding. And then the second part of the etymological breakdown of de facto comes from the Latin noun factum. Facto comes from the Latin noun factum, meaning deed, act, or achievement. De facto is often used to describe someone who represents or embodies something in action, in their deeds, without that person necessarily formally claiming to be that thing in words. So again, de facto means that someone embodies a way of being in the world in their behavior, through their actions, but they don't necessarily claim to be that thing in words. So if someone acts in a, quote, Christ-like way, they could be called Christian in their deeds. They might be considered a de facto Christian. Even if you ask them, do you subscribe to formal Christianity or organized Christianity, they may say, no, I do not. I'm not a member of that religion. I don't consider myself a member of that religion. But if they truly acted in a way that was described as Christ-like because it was similar to the way Christ taught people to behave in the New Testament teachings in the New Testament scriptures, that person could be called a de facto Christian. So you could be called a de facto uh, anything after the word de facto, if you behave as that being or thing is described to be in words, because your deeds are truly expressing what that thing is. So in this image, it says, yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruits, you can identify people by their actions. It's not about what they say. It's not about what they say they are. It's not about what they claim to identify as. It is about what their actions show you in the very real world that they are and who they are. Again, as is said in you know New Testament scripture, by their fruits ye shall know them. It's about what you do in the world that is ultimately going to tell other people who and what you are, not what you say you are in words. So this is a very important thing to keep in mind and to distinguish what people say they are versus the real thing. Their actions are going to define who they truly are. So the question comes up, can a person be a Satanist and not even know it? Can you be a Satanist and not realize that you are a Satanist? And the answer is absolutely. It is absolutely true that a person can be a Satanist and not know it. They would not have to claim to be a Satanist to actually subscribe to the worldview, to the tenets, to the belief systems, and to the behaviors of what a Satanism is in the very real world. So again, this picture describes it. Someone could deny all they want to themselves, who they are inside, uh, depicted as the person on the left, not wanting to confront themselves, not wanting to look at themselves, being in a state of shame over who they really are deep inside. And the image on the right depicts someone who is wearing a mask. They could change every day to a different mask, to a different face. They could call themselves a million different things, but... It's their deeds, it's their actions that ultimately define who they are. So you could have a mask for saying that you're a Christian. This, this being can say, I'm a Christian. This being can say, I'm a Jew, I practice Judaism. They can say, I'm a Muslim, I practice Islam or a Buddhist, etc., so forth and so on. They can claim to be millions of different things in, through their mouth, through their words, okay? But the words does not define who the being actually is. What defines who and what the being actually is is how they behave in the world, what they do. Their deeds define them. So this is what a de facto Satanist is. It's a Satanist in their deeds, in their actions. They are defining themselves as a Satanist. And it's a little bit more than that even. It's your mindset. 
because your mindset is ultimately going to determine how you behave. See, mentalism precedes everything. How you think is how you're going to behave in the world. What your belief system is, what your worldview is, is ultimately going to drive your behavior. So, the Satanist indeed has to first accept the Satanic mindset in their mind. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. That's what ultimately defines. Those are the defining characteristics and hallmarks of what a Satanist truly is, whether they claim to be one or not. Someone can claim to be a Christian, and in their mindset and their deeds, they're a Satanist. They can claim to be a Jew, and in their minds and in their deeds, they're a Satanist. They can claim to be any number of religions or any number of philosophies, but it is their overarching mindset, their worldview, that then informs and drives their deeds that is ultimately going to define who they are in this world through their behavior. Above all else, Satanism is a mindset, and this is what has to be completely understood. One of the most critical principles of natural law is that all things begin as thoughts. Again, that is the principle of mentalism in natural law. This principle eventually extends to the macrocosmic law. As humans think in the aggregate, so shall be the quality of their collective experience on earth. Your mindset ultimately determines behavior and your behavior ultimately determines the quality of your experience that is how natural law functions to bring us the consequence not only of what we believe but how we behave in the world and then we we have made that bed and then we must sleep in it if the slave masters of our world can give a lower level far less informed variant of their own mindset their own religion to those they wish to rule over, it becomes that much easier for them, the Satanists, to control their would-be slaves, people who they give a lower level variant of their very own mindset and religion to, that those people, their slaves, don't even understand is the lower level mindset of their ruling class masters. Again, the principle of mentalism dictates that the all is mind, and that the universe is ultimately a mental construct derived by and directed by mind. These are uh, teachings that are taught in the Hermetic traditions and many other traditions that teach natural law. But here is the variant that I've explained to people that I hope communicates through pop culture, uh, the idea that we are thinking like our own enslavers. Their greatest trick that they pulled was not even convincing us that Satan doesn't exist. It's, it's giving us the lower level variant of the Satanic mind, what I call mini me Satanism. They have to give you a lower level variant of their, of their mindset in order to rule you. If you get out and come out of the Satanic mindset, truly, truly, it exit it truly emerge from it you cannot be controlled by the higher level dark occultists in the world ultimately you can't be controlled physically yes they can manipulate other people to do their dirty work for them but you yourself would be at least free mentally and spiritually okay so again i call de facto Satanism, the name that I've coined and given to it is mini me Satanism from the Austin Powers series of Dr. Evil being the nemesis of the, uh, you know, a protagonist in the series of movies. These are comic movies. Um, and, uh, the Dr. Evil character representing the, you know, embodiment of, uh, the, the narcissistic villain has a small, uh, version of himself that he calls mini me and that is what they're essentially doing in 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 uh in an allegorical way in in a, in a as an analogy they are giving you a small version of who they are mentally in the mindset in the belief system and that enables them to control people because they are in a controlled in a, in a controllable programmed state in the mind so Mini me Satanism could be another term, or it's my term really, for what de facto Satanism actually is as a mindset. 
So then the question becomes, what in fact is the satanic mindset? We've described that Satanism is an occult religion. It's ancient. The rulers of our world, the, the people who are truly enthroned behind the scenes, the, the ostensible corridors of power, who are truly enthroned behind all worldly institutions, are dark occultists or ancient psychologists who are manipulating the people of this world into compliance and submission to their will. But what is their mindset? What is the defining hallmarks and characteristics of their belief system that they then give to us at a lower level that enables people to be able to be controlled? And again, this is going to be some review from Demystifying the Occult Part 2, but it's necessary as a setup to help people to understand de facto Satanism. There are four main tenets of the Satanic mindset or religion. The first is selfishness or egotism. Again, I would claim that you could call Satanism egotism or the religion of the self, and it would be highly accurate. Uh, but I think, you know, referring to it as Satanism really connects it with the concept of the adversary, the adversarial dynamic in nature, involution, the force which is holding human consciousness back, which is highly accurate. So the first tenet of Satanism is the dictum that self-preservation is the highest law. And it's not just self-preservation, it's self-advancement, and it's really the, apotheos the apotheosis of self, of ego. It's ego as God, as we're going to talk about. But put in other words, the first Satanic dictum of self-preservation is the highest law really means this. The survival and comfort of the physical self is always a more important goal than doing what is morally right. Live for yourself only and care only about you and yours. Okay? That's the ultimate driving directive of Satanism, of the Satanic mentality, pure egotism. If you even must step on others to get what you want, then so be it, for this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And how many people think exactly like that and live exactly like that? See, this is the key that I'm trying to connect in people's minds. If Satanism is about pure egotism and selfishness, how many people do you say, see embodying that ideology? How many people do you see living like that in the world and making that their mindset and their ideology? It's most people. It's not a matter, it's not a question of how many people are in the satanic mindset. It's a question of how many are not. It's a tiny handful that are not in this mindset. They have inculcated most of the world into a lower level variant of the satanic religion. Uh, the tenet that clearly defines the overarching worldview of satanism is perpetual me, me, me thinking. So I asked the question in breaking down the very first tenet of Satanism as egotism and selfishness. Would you or would you not agree that the vast majority of individuals in our society, in our world, subscribe to such a worldview? And I think if you're being honest with yourself, you realize that it's virtually everyone. It's a, it's a matter of who have they not gotten who have they not converted to this religion of selfishness? This is our entire culture. This is our entire worldview as human beings, as human society. And that's what has to ultimately change. And that's a tall task. That's why it's called the great work to change it. The second tenet of ideological Satanism is moral relativism. Again, when we break down what it is, you'll see most people subscribe to this worldview. Moral relativism is the ideology that there is no objective difference between right behavior and wrong behavior. There's no real objective moral standard of behavior. It's purely arbitrary. So human beings may arbitrarily create or decide for themselves what right and wrong are based upon their own whims and their own preferences. It's just a subjective construct of the mind that we can say this is right, this is wrong, if that's what's comfortable for us, if that's what feels right for us. 
In other words, that which we consider right for ourselves is what is right, and that which we consider wrong for ourselves is what is wrong. Since, according to the inherent and objective laws of morality, the aggregate amount of morality present in the lives of the people of any given society is directly proportional to the amount of freedom in that society. That is how natural law functions. Aggregate freedom determines aggregate morality. Then true freedom can never exist in a society that embraces moral relativism because that society will almost always behave in an immoral capacity or allow behavior in an immoral capacity to go on unrestrained and unchecked and unchallenged. So I ask people to ask themselves honestly the question and honestly answer, more importantly, honestly answer the question. Do you agree or disagree that the vast majority of human beings in our society subscribe to the ideology of moral relativism? As a matter of fact, again, I tell people the anecdote all the time. I've done many, many social experiments, literally going to street corners in different geographic areas and just asking people, we have a quick poll that we're conducting, do you think right and wrong are inherent in the natural world, inherent to nature, or are they subjective human constructs of mind that we get to invent and decide upon? And we, we've gotten upwards of 70% of people in some areas, 75%, three out of four human beings in, in what I might call slightly better moral areas of hu the human population in certain geographical regions. We've the lowest percentage that we've gotten in these social uh, experiments is two thirds, two out of three. Never even once in all the social experiments that we've done over the years gotten even a 50-50 breakdown. Minimum two out of three people are moral relativists. The highest that we've gotten in any one given geographic area is three out of four, so over 75, slightly over 75%. Imagine that. This is where we're at in human consciousness, and it's rapidly growing worse, not better. Until we do something about it, it will continue to get worse. So that's the second tenet of Satanism, moral relativism, the belief that there's no objective right or wrong, they're constructs of the mind, and we can make, up, make them up and say whatever they are. This leads to the third tenet, which is social Darwinism. And again, these are loosely defined tenets. You're not going to find like one book or document that just says this is exactly what they are. From me being in the religion for many years, I garnered this through speaking with people, through also reading texts and seeing what people who espouse the satanic ideology say. This has to be understood. This is a, uh, a condensing of many years of research and not only research, but personal lived life experience on my part being around these people and having very in-depth discussions with them on many occasions. Social Darwinism is the third tenet. This is the extension of the theory of Darwinian macrobiological evolution into the human domain, into human society. So you're bringing animal behavior and theories regarding it into the human realm, which is a big slippery slope, if you properly understand it. The proponents of Darwinian macrobiological evolution postulate the notion of survival of the fittest animals, meaning that animals who are the most dominant will rule their social strata in the animal kingdom. Applying this then to the human domain, this theory puts forward the notions that, number one, it is the quote-unquote natural order and even desirable on the behalf of human beings for human society to be ruled by the most dominating and vicious of humans. And two, the second notion is that such human beings' genes are the reason that they acquired 
their position of power in the first place and the reason that they maintain their positions of power in human social strata. So would you agree or disagree that the vast majority of human beings in our society subscribe to such an ideology? That they're perfectly fine with there being this hierarchical construct of rulers over other human beings that make the decisions for many, many, many other people? And they believe it's just fine and it is actually the natural order for a small group of dominant, vicious domineering control freak human beings to really seize and maintain power over other people and dictate how they must live and i'd say most people are perfectly fine with it that is generally being perfectly okay with the concept of government because that's what it is government is a form of slavery and it is basically saying these human beings can get to dictate that's called making a law over how all of the rest of human beings are going to live because they consider that they know better, that they're just, you know, uh, better fit to rule, better fit to make those decisions for others, and then other people must obey their dictates. And that's just the form of slavery through violence and coercion that we euphemize with the word government. And that's what that all comes out of the belief in social Darwinism. If people did not believe in social Darwinism, they would never put up with the slavery called government. And that is how this satanic mindset gets into the minds of the average person and just rules over their entire men mentality and ultimately their spirit. The fourth and final tenet is taking the other three tenets of the satanic mindset to their natural conclusion, you might say. And it is eugenics, or what I like to call even better than eugenics, it's actually dysgenics. Because it's not the passing along of good expressions of genetics, it's actually degrading human genetics over time to make people easier to rule. But uh, in Satanism, they would call this eugenics, and here's what it is. The word eugenics is derived from the Greek adjective eugenes, which means well-born. Eugenes as an adjective in Greek is in turn derived from the Greek adjective eu, meaning good, and the Greek noun genos, meaning race or stock. So we put them all that all together. Eugenos, eugenes, means um, well-born, um, those with good genes. Okay, in the mindset of those who are postulating what uh, you know their variation or version of good and bad are. So eugenics, as practiced in our world, is a social ideology advocating the promotion of higher rates of sexual reproduction for people with traits and characteristics desired by its proponents or desired by the ruling class and reduced rates of sexual reproduction and sterilization for those with undesirable undesired traits and characteristics this tenet describes the ideology of satanism taken to its ultimate conclusion the final solution you might say it goes something like this. Since man is God, and he gets to make up what right and wrong are, and since it is simply the quote-unquote natural order for the most ruthless of human beings whose genes are the fittest, quote-unquote, to rule the rest of the human herd, then that, quote, elite class of human beings in the highest positions of worldly power have every right to decide who is allowed to live and procreate and who must die and will not be able to procreate and pass along their genetic characteristics. And again, as I talked about in many other presentations and podcasts, this even extends into the realm of mind and becomes a mind control method of having people actually remove characteristics from the gene pool on their own without them having to do it through physical death, through physically killing people or preventing them from actually having children through coercion. 
the people are doing it through a form of mind control to themselves. And I call that epi eugenics, or again, what I would describe more accurately as epidisgenics, giving people a mindset that will degrade future expressions of human beings. So going beyond traditional eugenics and not even practicing truly eugenics, good passing along of characteristics, but it's, it's active dysgenics, and I call it epidysgenics is my term for it, which is through mind control, making people degrade themselves so that you, ha you come out with a weakened variation of the human being on the other side that is an easy slave to rule. And that's what one of the big ideologies of Satanism is, uh, degrading the gene pool, degrading uh, the expression and characteristics of what a human being is, not just through genes, but through behavior as well. So to, to define ultimately what a de facto Satanism is, it's embodying, believing in, and expressing the general tenets of Satanism at a lower form of expression than the, the high level member dark occult ruling class through your deeds, through your own behavior, through your the expression of your behavior, but which is ultimately directed through your mindset. A Satanist in their deeds is a Satanist indeed. And here are the defining characteristics expressed ultimately once again here. There are the five points of the inverted star, the inverted pentagram, which originally represented the five elements of earth, air, water, and fire. And then the fifth element of spirit, which should be in a uh, defining uh, higher level position, which is ultimately directing the other four elements. And the top uh, point of the star would be uh, the fifth element of spirit. And Satanism, again, seeks to invert everything. So they're trying to destroy the spirit. They're trying to destroy spirituality and keep it suppressed by these other tenets of pure selfishness, egotism, and materiality. So selfishness and egotism is one of the four points of the pentagram, the inverted pentagram, moral relativism, social Darwinism, eugenics and dysgenics, all ultimately designed to destroy human spirituality to destroy the human spirit so that people can be ruled and kept slaves in our world. And that is exactly what the human condition is, covert slavery. And it is all done through the destruction of human spirituality through the other tenets of Satanism and getting people to do it to themselves by subscribing to this belief system which they are ultimately inculcated into from the moment they're born. And a lot of people um, wrongly insist that if you're nice, you can't be a Satanist. And I just want to emphatically state, niceness has nothing to do with this, folks. You can be a nice person or put on the air that you're a nice person and absolutely be a Satanist in your mind and in your deeds. Niceness is not the determining factor regarding whether a person embodies the mindset of Satanism in their lives. So nice people can be de facto Satanists. And as a matter of fact, most people in our society who are perfectly nice to the average human being that comes into contact with them on a daily basis, inside their mentation, in their psychology, and in their behavior, they are de facto Satanists. And they're just wearing a mask of niceness. You know, if you peel away those layers of the onion, if you peel all those masks away, you're going to find a Satanist underneath. And this is most people. This is the average person. Okay? We're not talking about a small minority of people. The active ruling class, higher level Satanists are a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of human beings, far less than 1%. Your everyday average person who someone would consider a perfectly nice human being, deep down in their own psychology and ultimately in the behaviors they enact in the world, are satanic. They're de facto Satanists. Most people falsely believe that just because someone is quote unquote nice to others makes them a truly good person, when in fact that is not the case. 
a truly good person has to properly understand objective morality and natural law and willfully choose right behavior over wrong behavior. Most people don't even understand what right behavior is versus wrong behavior. That's why they advocate for so much immoral wrong behavior in the world. De facto Satanists seem like quote unquote nice people and still completely espouse and embody the satanic mindset regarding what they believe and how they live in the world through their actions, through their deeds. This is a very important distinction to make, a very important concept to understand, and it's a difficult pill for many people to swallow. Yet it is true, nonetheless, whether you are triggered by this or not, this is exactly what is going on in our world. This is exactly what de facto Satanism is and is about. And it has nothing to do with whether you treat other people nicely in your day-to-day -day interactions with them. It's all about what you believe and ultimately what behaviors you yourself are either conducting or espousing that others conduct. Another defining hallmark characteristic of the mentality of de facto satanism is only ever thinking about you and yours it's me 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 thinking all the time and others are left at the back burner and people will underestimate how often they do this they don't really put their mindset in the, the mentality of thinking about the whole world of human beings at large and how the entire human condition is enslavement most human beings only ever think of their own personal life situation from the moment they wake up in the morning until the moment they go to sleep each night. That's all they ever think about is themselves and their own. Again, they may perhaps consider their immediate family, their extended family, their friends, etc. Right? People who are close to them and help them in their daily situations in life. People may consider them in addition to themselves. And I say may, you know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't even do that. But very little beyond that, if anything. For anyone who is genuinely attempting to be honest with themselves, and that's the first uh, dictate of awakening. If you're going to truly awaken, you can't lie to yourself. You have to be honest with yourself about the dynamics that you see at work in the world. So if we're going to really be honest with ourselves, okay, that fact cannot be denied. Most people only care about themselves, only are concerned with themselves and their only life's their their own life situation, and very little beyond that. Again, they may consider family and friends, may not even do that. But if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we can't deny that fact. We have to accept that that's a daily fact of everyday life. And that's what defines de facto Satanism. Perhaps nothing better illustrates de facto Satanism. Selfish thinking is the primary defining hallmark of the Satanic mindset and ideology. So again, I ask you to be honest with yourselves. How many people think this way? How many people would you honestly estimate are in this me, me, me mindset all day, every day, from the minute they wake up till the minute they go to sleep at night? And if you're honest with yourself, you're, you're telling yourself the truth about an important dynamic of the world. How many people are completely self-centered? How many people are just in me, me, me mentation? How many people don't really care what's going on in the world? They only care about their own comfort, their own life situation. Be honest about the dynamic and then you're going to truly understand what, what our work is to do to truly enlighten and wake other people up. They can't stay in that mentality if the whole world dynamic and the whole world situation is to change for the better. It's not possible. And that's a sobering reality that most people do not want to accept in life. The overwhelmingly vast majority of human beings are rarely, if ever, uh, sorry, rarely, if ever, consider the wider situation of human reality and the human condition. They never think for one second of the day about human freedom or how it is being destroyed by the tyranny of government. Most people. 
They are unconcerned with the continuation of human slavery. They don't even consider that dynamic as the human condition. They care nothing for the suffering of others as long as they themselves are comfortable in the immediate sense. This is exactly what Satanism is at its foundational core. I can't stress that enough. Not caring about anything wider than yourself, your immediate family and friends, is exactly what Satanism is. That's what Satanism is. Care for the self only, no care for the wider issues that are taking place in the body of humanity to improve the human condition by, of course, improving the human mindset within the self first, then helping others to in become enlightened and improve their condition and therefore help the world improve its collective condition, its aggregate condition. It's only done when we first change our own mindset and come out of the de facto satanic ideology. And we're nowhere near that state. We're deeply entrenched and entrapped by it. Another hallmark defining characteristic psychologically of being a de facto Satanist is always wanting immediate sensate gratification, immediate pleasure in the moment, regardless of what the long-term consequences are, because one has no willpower to change. How many people would you say are like that? Almost everyone. Most human beings have been conditioned to believe that the end goal of human existence are indeed our very purpose for living, the purpose of life, is to accumulate as much sensate pleasure and comfort as possible in life. That describes almost everyone, with a relative few exceptions. They live in a state of conditioned response, desiring only immediate sensate pleasure to such an extent that they lack the basic willpower even to stop engaging in habits that are ultimately leading them into a condition of sickness and disease. They can't bring about internal willpower and strength of will to even act in their own interests. That's how conditioned in, in an immediate response mechanism they are to pleasure and sensate gratification in the immediate sense. In this sense, the satanic ego that they embody actually acts as a mechanism to degrade and weaken those who subscribe to it, making them easy prey for the dark occult ruling class to poison, to degrade, to damage their ability to think properly, to have proper health to even wage any counter war against this dark occult ruling class and not to understand their psychological strategies because the degradation of the mind will inev inevitably lead to the degradation. Uh, the, the degradation of the body will in inevitably lead to the degradation of the mind and the will. And very few people have even put this dynamic together. They have, very few people have even put this strategy, this uh, way of going about accomplishing the dark occult agenda together. They can't see it for what it is. And that's because they're stuck in that I want immediate sensate gratification all the time. They cannot even delay gratification. They want it immediately. And uh, again, this is a very important dynamic to consider and to understand, especially in light of how the dark occult uh, interact among themselves and raise their, their own children who are going to be the future, groomed to be the future rulers of the world. The inability to delay personal sensate gratification until a later time is one of humanity's primary weaknesses, and that's one of the dark occult's primary strengths. Interestingly, the ability to delay gratification until primary goals have been met is a defining characteristic of dark occultists and a skill they always strive to teach their own young who will eventually inherit their worldly power, especially if worldwide consciousness does not improve on a grand scale. Very, very important concept to keep in mind. Very few researchers actually even ever talk about that. Again, another primary aspect of the mentation, the psychology of de facto Satanists or in other words, just about every human being is the ego 
or the self raised to apotheosis or God-like uh, position in the mind, uh, of seeing the self as God, seeing the ego as the highest force in the universe, seeing human beings in general as the highest power in the world. How many people who have no spirituality, uh, and whether you're religious or not, they simply do not consider any power in the world higher than the power of a human being. They think as long as they do something and get away with it in the physical sense, that's all that ultimately matters is if you get caught in the physical, that's the only way that you're going to experience negative consequence when that is in fact not the case. Most human beings would not specifically themselves claim to be God or to even see themselves as God, yet their behavior is how you will know them as de facto Satanists. How selfish is their behavior? Most people in the modern world do not think there is any higher power than human beings. And if that they and if and that if they exercise immoral behavior in their lives, the only way they will ever experience consequences for that behavior is if they are caught and punished by other human beings. See, they don't really consider the dynamic of natural law and karma. They might say that they believe in karma, but they don't really behave that way. Again, it's not a matter of what people say. It's a matter of how they behave. And most people see human beings in general as the highest power in creation. They don't see anything that has created in the natural world a set of laws that will ultimately hold them to account for their behavioral choices and bring the consequences of those behavioral choices to the world. That is, in fact, what natural law is and what it does. And most people don't understand natural law. They don't recognize it. They will not even claim that it exists, let alone do they truly understand how it works upon the aggregate uh, human behavioral choices and ultimately uh, the behavioral conditions that we then inherit through those choices. And that is how our laws of consequence are the laws that govern our behavioral consequence actually works. And that is what natural law is. Most people will just do whatever they have to, to get ahead in life. Even if it means stepping over other people or using them as stepping stones, they care very little as long as they don't receive consequence in the physical world. But the real question is, is what are they doing to themselves thinking this way and behaving this way at a soul level? And again, I'm not talking about the minority of people and I'm not talking about the very tiny minority that are actually in the ruling class. I'm talking about the everyday average uh, Joe and Sally, okay? The everyday person. And you would be disturbed if you are honest with yourself and really look at that dynamic. It would be highly disturbing how many people think like that and how many people are in, inculcated into this de facto satanic religion and mindset if you're being honest with yourself if you're lying to yourself you'll tell yourself a drastically different story but if you look at the dynamic honest honestly you'll see it for what it is another aspect of their psychology is the ego acts as the arbiter of right and wrong and this is the whole biblical allegory in genesis in the old testament of eating of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil it does not mean to consume a fruit the knowledge the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is about being the arbiter of right and wrong to take it into oneself to consume it is to arbitrate that decision of what right and wrong is allegorically it's not literally about picking a, a physical fruit off of a tree and eating it it's about taking right and wrong into ourselves to make the decision about whether it is right or wrong instead of recognizing right and wrong as inherent characteristics in nature because it is about whether the behavior initiates harm to another sentient being or not and then willfully aligning our behavior with right over wrong. Most people do not understand that those characteristics and have not made that judgment, and therefore they're still operating as an arbiter of right and wrong based on whims, based on their comfort levels, based on what they want in the world, what they consider right for them, etc. 
So most human beings, as we've already talked about, talking about moral relativism, obviously this directly relates with moral relativism, believe that right and wrong are subjective human constructs of the mind. They see no inherent moral contradiction even with man-made laws being completely different in different places or at different times. That's one of the most blatant characteristics of the laws of man is that it is completely morally relativistic. One thing could be legal in one place, illegal in another place across an imaginary line called a state or national boundary. It can be perfectly considered moral and legal, quote unquote, at one time, and then the law changes, and then you could do the exact same behavior at another time and it'd be perfectly seen as okay or moral. This is absolute nonsense. It's absolute garbage. Anybody that thinks that way cannot exercise true logic, true reason, true morality, and they are moral relativists. I'll give an example in a moment. But they are perfectly comfortable with the idea of what's right for me is right and what's wrong for me is wrong. At any given time or place, that can change. That's why it's moral relativism. Such morally relativistic thinking is what truly defines the mindset of a de facto Satanist. It's one of the biggest defining psychological characteristics of a de facto Satanist. And again, we could just look at an example of any type of laws. You could look at gun carry laws. You know, you could look at uh, the permitting of certain behaviors. And you could look at, again, uh, prohibition in certain states versus uh, certain states saying it's perfectly okay for to use um, what they call marijuana, which should be properly called cannabis, in a medical capacity or even in a recreational capacity. So the blue states have recreational usage of cannabis. The green states have medically, pro, uh, medically prescribed uses of cannabis. And the gray states in this graph have are still saying that cannabis is going to be tightly controlled. And if you uh, use it or, you know, uh, distribute it there, you can be caged. You can be thrown in a cage and your freedom can be taken from you. So the answer is, the question is, who's right? Which of these states are correct? Which of these states are incorrect? Is it a right to imbibe a substance into one's own body because you own your body? Of course it is. Anybody who's making any restriction on that is committing a wrongdoing by preventing the exercise of a right to decide what you will place into your own body. That's separate that if you act irresponsibly after imbibing any substance, whether it be cannabis, alcohol, or, or you know, liquid bleach, uh, what you're going to go and do to another person has, is completely separate from the first behavior of imbibing a substance or a compound. That's nobody's business of what you put into your body. It's secondary and another decision and another behavior if you go out and harm somebody else and you don't have the right to initiate harm. So again, making up laws in different state boundaries at different times and at different places is all moral relativism. And again, the satanic mindset thinks that that's fine. It doesn't see the inherent moral contradiction in that. It doesn't see the moral illegitimacy of man's law. It perfectly accepts that and it's perfectly reasonable to it because again, it's only considering what it considers to be right based on the way the individual being feels. It's not considering what's objectively true regarding right and wrong based upon whether the action that is actually being done initiates harm to another sentient being or not in that moment. And again, this is the majority of the world on both sides of the political spectrum. Doesn't matter what aisle people come down on, you know, side of the aisle they come down on politically, or even whether they're, they consider themselves anarchists or not in many cases. Most people are moral relativists, regardless of what they claim to be politically. And most people do not see the inherent contradiction in the moral relativism of man's laws, you know. Or everybody who's very rigidly uh, politically defines themselves, uh, you know, through the left-right paradigm politically certainly thinks like that. And then libertarians to a lesser degree and perhaps anarchists to a lesser degree than them. But even in the anarchist community, as I've talked about many times, you have that type of satanic, morally relativistic thinking, unfortunately.
I've done a lot of work to try to dis dispel that. Here's a huge one that I see in even in the freedom community, unfortunately, and it's a shame that people keep ascribing anim animal behavior and bringing that into the human domain. And this is, uh, again, connects directly with the tenet in Satanism as of social Darwinism. The false belief of a human being as quote unquote just another animal. Literally a quote in the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey is that human beings are just another animal, no different than any other animal in the animal kingdom. Part of the mindset that Satanists give to humanity is that human beings are quote just another animal. This is of course a false belief system because human beings have a far greater complexity in thought and exponentially more of an advanced capacity for holistic intelligence than the rest of the animal kingdom. That's why we can reason truly if we make ourselves capable of it and we can understand why a behavior is morally right versus why a behavior is morally wrong. And then we can use our capacity for holistic intelligence and free will also to choose the right behavior over the wrong behavior. That is the exercise of conscience. If people latch on to this false belief of humans as just other animals, we make the dangerous mistake of accepting animalistic behavior in human society and human civilization. And that's a very steep, slippery slope to proceed upon. This is taking the construct of Darwinism into the human social domain. That is, in fact, what the mindset of social Darwinism is, why it's a tenet of worldwide satanic belief, and why they give us that belief system at a lower level for people to latch on and subscribe to. Because if we are thinking in a lower level form as them, not even understanding how the entire world's power structure truly works and the religion that it is ultimately ruled by, we're easy prey to these dark occult predator class, elitists. And that is in fact how they have inculcated us and that's how they continue to rule us. Again, belief that we are nothing more than animals brings animalistic behavior into the human world, into the human sphere of influence, the human domain. And again, you can see this in no, no better illustrated in the realm of statism or the belief in government. Back in uh, black slavery time period around the American, uh, pr prior to the American Civil War, the you know, a plantation owner says, it's my right to force other people to work in my fields. You know, imagine believing that you could own other people bodily. That's overt slavery. Today we have the covert slavery of government that says, it's my right to force upon others to pay for what I want. Force other people to pay for what they want. Takes from, from them whatever amount they deem necessary forceful confiscation of wealth to pay for what they want to see enacted in the world. I mean, imagine this. And people think it's fine. See, that's what Satanism is. Thinking that immoral behavior is just perfectly normal and okay. And this is what they're inculcating the world into. It's not only forcing people to pay what you say they want. It's now forcing people to put things into their own bodies that you say that they should have in their body that they don't want in it. There's no better definition of slavery. You're making a direct claim on the body. Even something like this with taking money from people, you're taking the fruit of their labor that they performed with their body and mind. And you're taking the product of that, the fruit of that labor. That's an indirect claim on the human body. Literally saying you must put this into your body is a direct claim upon the body. That's slavery, folks. By any other name you want to call it, I don't care how you want to euphemize it. It's slavery. It's the claim upon the body. And this is what people have to understand. Every single person who believes in any form of taxation, you believe in slavery. And that makes you an immoral being. Believing in government is just believing that one class of people can construct dictates that another class of people must follow. That's slavery. It's not my belief that it is. 
It's what it actually is. And if you don't think so, you are incorrect and wrong, and you're morally wrong for thinking that that's perfectly okay. That makes you a bad person. That makes you an immoral being in your mind, in your consciousness, and then what you condone to be done. And we have to be honest about it. We have to tell people that you are a bad person for thinking that way. You are a bad person for condoning that other people behave that way and continue to behave that way. And that another class of people continue to be subjected to that violence and coercion and duress. It's not okay. It's immoral. And it's a defining hallmark of immorality and Satanism. And you know what leads to all of that? What leads to even the belief that statism should be put in place? Oh, we're just bad people by our nature. And then you have other people. Oh, no, people are all just good. They're, 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 they're just good people by their nature. You know, a lot of religionists think that way. Or a lot of people who are often, you know, wonderland somewhere that don't understand what's really been, been done to the human mind, to the human psyche through the type of covert mind control that has been conducted against the population they think in this dialectical construct of human nature is either good or bad it's a complete false belief and false notions of what the actual nature of a human being is and again this is very combative because people feel very strongly about this to the point where they make it part of their religious belief system in the mind and all of them are wrong the, the, there's so few people who accurately understand what the nature of a human being is by nature of reality in the physical world with, with without anything being given to them. How we come into the world inherently through our nature is a programmable state. And if you don't understand that, the ultimate chess master, slave masters of the world who are playing a game of chess and the average moron in this world doesn't even understand what checkers are, let alone how to play checkers, has not sat at the chessboard with the chess masters and is not even on the same level of being able to, to even understand how this game is played. Okay, This is how unsophisticated psychologically the average person is. They have such a low level unsophisticated psychology that it's, it's child's play for these people to deceive them and manipulate them because they don't even understand something as basic of what human nature actually is. And this is a proven, it's, it's, it's absolutely completely proven to be this way. It is not an opinion. It is not subjective. Human nature is neither good or evil. It is neither good or bad. We don't come in. What human being pops out of the womb behaving a certain way? This is all people have to stop and ask themselves. A simple question that puts the question to rest once and for all. If you're any kind of an honest person or if you even have a modicum of, of average intelligence. It doesn't require an extremely high IQ. No one comes into the world a psychotic murderer and control freak no one comes into the world behaving saintly and you know understanding everything information is what determines how one behaves over the course of one's life if we're very high information and we've really seen the big picture of what is really going on in our world and how things really work we can willfully change our behavior willfully mold our behavior and have positive outcomes, have good results on the other side. If we don't do that, we're low information, ignorant people, we're easily led, we're easily deceived, we're easily manipulated, and we're always putting out garbage result into our lives. And then we want to scream and complain about it as if it isn't us doing it to ourselves. This is how human nature really works. So let's look at the information on this slide. Most people hold a completely erroneous belief about human nature. They falsely believe that human beings are either good or bad by their very nature. Completely contrary to these popular but incorrect beliefs, the reality of human nature is that human beings are simply programmable. We are programmable beings. I'm sorry, I'm apologizing. I accidentally keep knocking this microphone. Um, it's the first day I'm using it. I'm using a new mic and I'm not used to being in the position, so I have to be more careful with my hand gestures. So I apologize for that. This is a live recording. So 
we are not computers, but we, like computers, are programmable mentally. What we believe eventually becomes our behaviors. So if programmed beliefs can be inserted into the mind like a computer virus, bad output happens on the screen of life. If good coding happens in the mind and we understand accurately what's going on within ourselves and in our environment, then we can put good behavior out into the world, good output. It's the garbage in, garbage out dynamic of computers, often called G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. Okay, good behavior in, good behavior, good programming in, good information in, good behavior out. That's what we have to understand it as an allegory for or a, an analogy of. So we're not computers, but much like computers, if a human being has a bad file system format, which is the conditions during a child's formative years, their formative years. It's like laying the file format onto a hard drive when we format the drive. We're doing that with our children when they're in a highly programmable state in the first six and a half to seven years of life. That's their formative years. Then we might give them a bad operating system. That's our culture that we're at, we're at, uh, that's at work in our environment. That's culture which is the collective belief systems and bad software, right? If we, we install badly written software programs into the human mind, then that's erroneous, rigid, and dogmatic belief systems that people just accept as being true. If we put all of that in, what's going to be the output? The output, which is behavior, which is the way of being in the world, onto the screen that we call, the, the screen is life, our environment, our daily operating environment, is also going to be garbage. If all that garbage programming goes in, do you expect good output onto the screen of life, quote unquote, or do you expect horrific, tragic outcome, total garbage result? What do you think is going to be the manifested result? It doesn't take a brain surgeon or a genius to figure it out. Once again, if we're honest with ourselves. So, the, if garbage goes in, garbage comes out and the behavior that we output will be bad and will contribute to deteriorating conditions on a mass scale in our world. Similarly, like a computer, the behavior of a human being will largely depend upon its programming the, or it, the quality of information that is input into the being which will enable it to process and create efficiently if it's good. So if good information slash programming goes in, the good result comes out on the other side. If garbage programming goes into the being, garbage result comes out on the other side. When we take this into the aggregate, that's the consequential results that we get societally, worldwide, and that's what natural law actually is. It, it, this isn't difficult to figure out for people who step back from their garbage programmed conditioned response belief systems given to them by religion and whatever ideology somebody else has tried to program into their mind and you sit and think about it properly for a long period of time that you can't really come to any other logical conclusion than that if you're honest. If you want to lie to yourself, you keep telling yourself somebody comes in inherently good, somebody comes in inherently bad. It's all complete garbage BS, but if you want to lie to yourself and tell yourself that, you feel free, go right ahead and keep lying to yourself. You're not doing anybody else a disservice but yourself, but then you do do a disservice by teaching garbage beliefs to others that aren't true. And unfortunately, that's what has happened in our world. This is a very important dynamic to understand because if people don't change their view of human nature, they stay in the satanic mindset. This is exactly what will help get you out of not only a satanic mindset, but a religious mindset. Most people in the satanic mindset believe human nature is bad or flawed from its inception, and even religionists think that. And people in a new agey or you know, other t type of religious mindset will often think, oh no, people are all just inherently good. 
neither is true they are both dangerous mental subscriptions to subscribe to because they don't accurately describe what the human condition really is the human condition is a programmable state that is capable of being changed through information when you understand that then you'll understand how important putting correct information out into the world is you'll you'll make a one-to-one -one correlation between those things and that's a huge part of the true awakening process again the negative belief in human nature believing the humans are just bad and need to be controlled is another defining hallmark characteristic of the psychology of de facto satanists because then the next thing that they'll want to do is they want to put an authority an authority system in place the belief in authority the belief in a hierarchical master slave relationship in our world uh, or in other words a, a command structure a power structure and really what it is is it's a chain of command and obedience that's what it really is it's people who blindly believe in authority and obey authority and that's the thing that has led to the most death and destruction in the history of our species and this is where the satanic the, the de facto satanic mindset is designed by the higher level satanists to lead us they're giving us their beliefs their false belief system at a lower level so that we will believe all the things that will allow them to create that power structure and ultimately enslave us it's genius from their perspective from the chess master perspective it is a genius strategy from the perspective of the people being ruled you, unless you wake up to it you're not going to understand how it works I'm trying I've been for 15 years trying to give people the playbook here folks from the from an insider perspective not from somebody who read about it in books not from somebody to listen to other people to understand it no I was inside that structure at a higher level than most people will ever see I'm trying to give you the enemy playbook you know right taken right from their whole sphere of influence and brought over to the other side of the playing field here's the plays they're, they're running here's their strategy this is their agenda and still people just aren't intelligent enough unfortunately to figure it out and then they want to come down on the person who's trying to tell them the truth about how you've been played how you've been fooled how you've been manipulated these people look at you like a joke believing in their authority they look at you like a tool and all all the people doing their bidding the order followers they look at you with nothing but contempt and they're using you like a tool and when they're done using you like the tool that you are they're going to throw you in a garbage dump and that's exactly how they see you boys and girls exactly exactly all the little children out there who are doing these evil psychopaths bidding all the police the military all the people in government all the people who are the order followers you know you're a joke to your masters you think you're involved in the power structure truly you'll get thrown under the bus at the earliest at their earliest inconvenience at the most convenient time that they can throw you under the bus when they're having a hard time you're going right under the bus little child that's exactly how they see you and that's what they're going to do to you and and history will tell you the truth of that lesson if you really pay attention to it but most people are too stupid and ignorant to study a long view of human history that's part of the problem you know if they did they would see exactly how this power structure eats them and when they're done eating what they want and chewing them up they'll spit they're going to spit your bones out that's how it really works that's how ruthless the people at the higher levels really are you ain't going to escape that you think you're going to be the last ones fed to the big beast as if that's some kind of a winning situation yeah keep thinking that way and see where it gets you okay but this is a huge part of de facto satanism so everybody that believes in this authoritative power structure and this hierarchical power structure you're all satanists you are satanists at the core of your belief system because you don't truly believe in freedom and you've bought falsely the notion that oh, all of humanity is is bad no we've been given bad information G being given access to the correct information we can make properly informed decisions about how we will behave we are conditioned 
to act in the ways that we act. That is not natural behavior. It is programmed behavior. And we were programmed at an earlier stage of our development in our lives in the formative years. And it's very difficult to break that conditioning. It can be done with a lot of work and with a lot of knowledge. And that knowledge, most people don't have it. They have not acquired it, let alone put it into practice in their lives. Another defining characteristic and hallmark of de facto Satanism is not even giving a damn, not caring about freedom in the presence of tyranny. You'll just watch tyrants destroy freedom, not say a word, not even look at it, not care, not, not speak against it. <clears throat> a huge hallmark of de facto Satanism is staying blind, deaf, and silent regarding the activity of tyrants in our world because it's cowardice. Deep down inside, de facto Satanism does not truly create and inspire courage. It's all about being a coward, acting only in your own little egocentric self-interest and never doing anything to put yourself at possible risk because these people are in fact dangerous and violent and should not be allowed to do what they're doing totally unchallenged. But only the courageous person is going to speak out against them. The de facto Satanist is going to sit back, hide, hide in the shadows, cower in fear, let them do whatever they do because they're a coward deep down inside their heart. De facto Satanists have been well trained only to care about their own comfort and not to speak out against or even recognize injustices that are done to others. This is cowardice to the ultimate degree. Cowardice to the ultimate degree. It is also one of the highest forms of immoral behavior because it completely ignores the destruction of justice and freedom. And, you know, there, there's no worse crime against humanity to sit back while tyranny is enacted and say, I don't care. I, it's not actively in the moment being done to my physical body. And if it's done to other people somewhere else or at another time, I couldn't give a damn. And be honest. See, part of this program, part of this whole presentation is I'm not only laying out the facts, I'm asking you to ask these questions to yourself and be honest when you answer them. How many people think like this compared to how many don't? If you're honest, almost everyone, percentage-wise, really deeply does not give a damn about human freedom to the extent that they're actively involved in trying to reverse the current trend toward tyranny. It's not about what you say you want. It's about what you're doing. See, that's the difference. If you're not doing anything, you don't care enough. You know, it's not just about you paying lip service to freedom. Another characteristic is just always doing what's easy instead of what's truly right. Most people don't have the fortitude, the courage, the willpower to truly do what is right. De facto Satanists in our world always strive to take the easy way out of just about any situation you could imagine. If that means doing the wrong thing, just not to be hassled or ridiculed toward themselves even or others, then they choose the wrong thing. Whatever is the most comfortable path, they're going to take it. They, they don't give any question or any care to what is morally right. And this describes most people. Doing what is right is not always what is easy. Admittedly. In fact, it is almost always the harder thing to do in life, doing what is right. And again, that's where I began this presentation. Choose the right thing and do the right thing because it's the right thing. Not for any personal reward, simply because it is the morally right thing to do. That's the consciousness we have to work toward and to actually step into and live in the world. Most people are not doing that. They're still in, always concerned about their selfish situation. De facto Satanists have been conditioned into this form of spiritual and mental weakness and cowardice. Not only do they take the so-called easy way out all the time, but they also try to influence other people, especially their own children, to make the same immoral decisions and the same immoral choices that they have made in life. 
And if we're honest with ourselves and we ask ourselves how many people are like that versus how many people are not, you'll get the correct answer regarding how many people are truly good in the world. How many truly good people exist in the, on this planet at this time and what our work is to do to change human consciousness so that people can actually build themselves into truly good people. That's the whole goal here, folks. The what's in it for me mindset defines de facto Satanism above all else. This is what defines it. De facto Satanists almost never think about doing something because it is the morally correct thing to do, but only think about whatever behavior they're going to decide upon in terms of what's in it for me. Is it safe? Is it, am I going to profit? Does it put me at an inconvenience? Etc. That's the, sa the de facto Satanic mindset. This kind of purely selfish thought is what has turned our entire society into a self-centered doggy dog culture. First principles and moral correctness should always be the factors that guide our behavior instead of purely selfish reward. This is one of the primary reasons so few people even speak out against the rampant evil that is at work in our world. They don't want to inconvenience themselves. They're cowards. It's, it's not expedient for them. They don't see what's in it for them. They don't see the immediate gratification, sensate reward. They never think in the long term, only in the short term, self-centered, self-gratifying way. And that's not going to get it done, folks. You know, we have to come out of that satanic form of thought. That's not higher consciousness. That's debased, degraded, satanic consciousness and mindset. That's what de facto Satanism ultimately is. So I'm going to conclude the presentation with a few slides about getting out of this mindset because I don't want to leave people with abject hopelessness. That's never my intent, folks. You know, uh, a lot of people think I'm some doomer and I am not. I'm a realist. I'm not a wild-eyed optimist seeing the world through rose-colored glasses, but I'm not a total doomer black pill person either. Okay. I tell people you got to reject the black pill and you got to get to the gold pill, right? Yeah. Take the red pill first for the information, but get the gold pill about your, what your actions should really be and how, wh what mindset to put your mind really in. And I'm not saying go and say, everybody's angelic and uh, this is just in the hands of God or it's all going to just work out. No evil can win. I, I repeat this over and over again. Be realistic. Evil is winning and evil can win permanently. And tyranny can be enacted and tyranny can reign for thousands of years. And if you want to leave that kind of a, a, a world to your children, then, you know, go and think whatever the hell you want and, you know, not really strive to learn what the truth of the matter is, you know, and keep staying in your satanic mindset. But if you want to change the, the result, the manifestation for not only ourselves, but for those who come after us in this world, our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, etc., our future progeny, then you have to understand the mindset that has to be formed to get out of de facto Satanism. And it's not easy. We have, again, we've been inculcated into this religious mindset since we were young. You know, th this religion has existed for aeons, for thousands and thousands of years before any of us were ever born. To get out of it is going to be a challenge. So I want to leave people with, it is possible. Is it hard? Exceptionally hard. Can it be done? Yes, it can. With enough willpower, with enough knowledge, care, and will. It can be done and people can reverse this mindset and come out of it. I did it. It took enormous shadow work upon myself for years of my life, not weeks, not months, but years. Okay. And that's why it's very important that people understand this and begin immediately if they're going to ever reverse that condition. And the first thing is you have to at least care about yourself enough to even start that process. True the True human awakening process always begins with the development of true self-respect. You have to care about yourself enough to want to come out of the mindset that gets you to care only about yourself. 
See, because that, that's the thing. It's false. It isn't really caring about the self. It's caring about the ego's desires, which have to be eventually not 100% buried forever. They have to be put in their proper place. This is what real spirituality and shadow work strives to help the individual to do. There's always going to be an ego. There's always going to be worldly desires. There's always going to be some level of selfishness at work in the world. It, the goal is not to try to be so perfect and saintly that you look at it as an impossible condition to reach to enlighten yourself and choose something different for yourself and the world. This is a very practical way of looking at becoming truly spiritual and enlightened. And it starts with true self-respect. And to understand this process or the beginning of it, I can't explain it all here, right? I'm giving you the very building blocks of getting out of this mindset. You have to first simply understand what respect truly is. And respect is this. It comes from the Latin, the etymological root of the word respect is the Latin prefix re, meaning to look at, to examine, to see, and the Latin um, verb spectare, which means to, to look at. I'm sorry, re means again. I stepped ahead of myself. The Latin prefix re means again or to do over, okay? And then the Latin verb spectare, meaning to look at, to see, to examine, True self-respect means that we re-examine ourselves. We take another look at our own mindset, our own worldview, our own beliefs, our own behaviors. And then in light of seeing ourselves in a different way through that process of self-re-examination or shadow work, then we willfully decide to make changes about the things that we know are shortcomings in ourselves and that we do not like about ourselves. We're honest with that. We, we don't we don't try to push that off to the side and say, oh, only good vibes, okay? No, you look honestly at what is falls short. You look honestly at what really does need to be improved. And then you willfully decide to change those things by an act of your will. And in doing so, you are then able to recreate who you are and how you think and how you behave in the world that contributes in the collective, in the aggregate of human behavior and that is how the world is improved by the individual changing themselves and their behavior that contributes to the collective change in human consciousness and behavior and that starts with self-respect it then has to move into the realm of courage to take action an internal quality within the self that one cannot get from someone else this has to be built like building a muscle by training by going to the gym by doing physical activity Courage is built like a muscle is built and you know, it can weaken if it is not practiced and used. We have to find the courage to sacrifice for human freedom, to get out of our comfort zone. And that's very uncomfortable. We have to become comfortable in discomfort, in how other people may see us, become exercise courage to speak out to others. Exercise courage to even face the truth and look at it and answer all the questions that I ask people to pose to themselves in a very honest capacity. That's going to require tremendous personal courage and that's no short order task. That's a very tall task. And again, that starts with self-respect and then courage will come as we do it more, as we engage in these dynamics more in our lives. And then finally, we have to actually activate the will. That's the external aspect of courage. You know, and you got to care enough to do all of this. This all ultimately stems from changing your heart intelligence. You know, the mind intelligence is going to ultimately be driven by what you care about. And then you're going to go out and get the information that you need to make the changes that you need to make internally and then help to in inspire externally. This is what real love is, folks. It's not a wishy-washy notion of romantic love. That's not to say that there's not a place for, you know, romantic love, brotherly love, etc., familial love, wonderful things in life to experience. But we need to find and activate a higher love, what is called agape in different occult traditions. 
A new view of love must emerge in our world. This is what true right action ultimately expresses, that we cared enough to act in the, in the morally right capacity. This new view of love must emerge in our world in order for human beings to leave the state of consciousness that I have referred to during the course of this presentation as de facto Satanism. One must find this higher love within oneself in the form of caring enough to take right action in the world. This means getting involved in the spiritual war that is before us, before our very eyes. Yourself, getting involved yourself by first improving yourself and then by speaking out to help others become enlightened so that they may then improve themselves as well. And that is how this chain of improvement continues on and on in the aggregate of humanity. By improving ourselves and then helping to inspire others. That is how we do it at, a, at an individual level and then it expands out to an aggregate or collective level. And that, doing that process of awakening the self out of this mindset of de facto Satanism and then helping to explain this to others and teach others and inspire others is the true activation of the will for the purposes of performing that great work of help, helping to elevate human consciousness out of de facto Satanism and the condition of human slavery. I'm going to close the presentation the way I began it at the beginning in the caveat section with a quote from Immanuel Kant. Do the right thing because it is right. Put the earthly or physical reward off to the side. Even the um, self-enlightened goal, the, the, the you know, uh, selfish, uh, enlightened self-interest, one might call it. Put all of that reward off to the side and simply look at what the morally correct thing is to do and choose it for that reason because it is morally true, correct, and right. Morality means doing what is right regardless of what you are told or regardless of how many other people are doing it. Obedience means doing what you're told regardless of what is right and just because everybody else may be doing it. That's what we have to properly understand to begin the process of coming out of de facto Satanism. And I'll leave you on that note. Do the right thing simply because it is the right thing to do. That is how the great work ultimately begins and what will ultimately drive it to a positive end. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your kind attention during this presentation.